Kyle Vanderwall. I teach AP U.S. History and U.S. History at Granville High School. When did you start flipping your classroom? Last spring was the first time I experimented with the flipped model. At the end of uh, AP U.S. History before the test, there's quite a push to get through all the curriculum, and that's one of the problems with any classroom, but in particular uh, AP U.S. History is the breadth of information, and it's uh, it's a push to get through it all. And so I. I'd heard of this flip model at an in-service and I thought, well, I, maybe I can put a few videos up, a, a few lectures and have uh, that cover the information instead of trying to push through it uh, in class because I often felt like giver of information and, and less uh, a, a teaching and correcting the students at times. How long is your typical class period here at the school? The class period itself, 57 minutes. Okay. So actual teaching time, by the time you get done with yeah. all the intermediate taking of attendance and stuff, what does that usually get down to, you think? If I'm lucky, 53 to 55. Okay. Yeah. And trying to cram all that into that time on an AP schedule is yeah. pretty difficult, right? It's very difficult. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons, I guess you, you could call it the impetus to do this, is a student last year while I was being observed, uh, you know, the administrator asked, you know, why didn't you speak up in, in the discussion in class? And her comment was, speak up I'm just trying to keep up and to me that said okay there might be a problem then because I'm sure she's not alone and with the, the flipped model the students are able to get I think twice as much and students have made that comment because you know they say well Mr. Vanderwall you're rewindable now and we can stop you and I get twice as much out of the videos uh, as I do in class which is a pretty cool thing. With your workflow about how you go about doing this. Do you do this inside class while you're actually doing teaching or is it an outside class? I know teachers do it in class. I do it outside of class. Um, and I do that for, I guess, a few reasons. One is I want to cover the material so they watch it at home. So when we come in, it's, it's discussion based. I'm not actually teaching them the information. They learn at home so that our conversations have a little more depth to them and they come in with uh, questions over the material rather than just scrambling and writing notes and, and learning it or hearing it for the first time in class. So what happens to those kids that don't watch the videos? What kind of things have you had to do as a teacher to help those students out? To the students who don't, well, they're few and far between, um, but the students who don't watch, I, I do have to go back through the material and when it's a quiz or if it's a writing prompt or an essay, it's pretty clear to that student who hasn't watched it, the, the learning experience comes from, did you watch the video? Well, no. Okay, well, all of this was covered in the video. And it's, you know, a light bulb goes off for the student, like, okay. And that actually hasn't been a, a big problem at all, so. And that is one of the questions I get from teachers a lot of times is, you know, what if, the what if the student can't get to it. Have you run into any of your students in your schools that don't have access to the material outside of school? Yes. Okay. And the way we fix that is, uh, in one case, uh, a student saved up enough money and went out and got an iPod uh, specifically for this class. In other instances, we've just said, we're going to run into some hurdles, but let's not let those be obstacles that prevent us from doing this. And so one of the things we've done is we've offered um, flash drives for students, um, CDs for students, that if they have a computer but maybe not the internet, they can do that. Um, we've also offered the library. Uh, open before school or after school and my room is always open for them as well to watch these videos if they for some reason don't have access. So what have you noticed about your student achievement? Okay the the achievement part is I think coming I think part of in my setting I guess in particular I deal with sophomores in an AP setting so it's already a pretty dramatic change and the learning curve is already steep so the flipped classroom, I think, has offered us time in class to get more in-depth into the material. And like I said, it's, it's less of me giving them the information and more of us making new discoveries about the information. They're making connections, which is what any classroom should be about. And so I, I guess I've noticed just a, a broader understanding of, uh, and a deeper understanding of, of what they're actually covering. And it's, it's been more meaningful in class to have these conversations. You, you mentioned that it seems, and I'll paraphrase here, it's more uncovering information than covering information. Yes. Do you see in your conversations with your students now that after they watched your video lectures um, that their engagement level is higher? It is because there's less confusion over the subject. They've already watched it. Um, they've probably uh, rewound at some point, paused it, they've taken notes. And in class, you know, if I'm doing a lecture in class, 
they get be far behind and then it's kind of a throw your hands up and I'm, I'm already too far gone to keep up. And this way the students really own their, their study habits and, and the timing of it. So what kind of feedback have you received from your parents? The parents like it a lot because they see an engagement with the, the students. It's, you know, I think a lot of teachers are frustrated with technology or either that it doesn't work properly or when I most need it, it goes down or the students are always on their phones, right? And in this sense, it's a way of empowering the students with technology. It's a way of teaching them to use the technology for something beneficial in school. And it's, you know, people can fight it all they want, but this is reality. And this is not just happening in schools, it's, it's all over the place. And I think it's, the, the parents have realized that this is changing not only how I teach, but probably more important to them, how their students are learning. And uh, the parents have more of a connection, because I've even had a few parents say, I've watched the, the, the vodcasts, which is pretty cool. cool. What kind of problems have you encountered with doing this, both technically and, and any other issues that you find? Uh, probably just the logistics. You know, how many videos should I put up uh, a week for a math or a science, mm -hmm. a sequential learning? It makes sense to, to maybe do it four or five nights a week. In my discipline, I'm not sure that that actually you know, necessarily fits right now. Uh, that if the students are going home two or three times a week to watch videos, it helps them come into class and it allows us to really break the material down, so to speak. Um, the one thing I've noticed, I guess, more than anything in my discipline is the writing. I can actually teach writing online. And I think research is showing right now that that's the way uh, students learn best. It's not to the punitive of this is what you did wrong uh, and here's your, your penalty as far as a grade. It's here's an example of what is correct. Okay, now I'll search through this document and I'll actually be on the smart board um, correcting other students' essays, other examples from years past. And so it allows them to see the example that is the correct way of doing it. So, so where do you house all of your material? Are you using a learning management system or any place to put all of your stuff? Two different things. Uh, one is I post all the videos on my website. In addition to that, they find the notes, um, the PowerPoint, or the Prezi, whatever I've, I've used to present the material, is also located on the website. So they can preview it, and then they can watch the video if they want. So it allows them to, to have structure to their, to their note taking. And then everything has been housed through Camtasia Relay on the website. Okay. Is this your own personal website that you have set up? Or is this like Google Sites or something like that? Um, I've used Weebly okay. uh, this year. So Weebly's been uh, a great format. The students like it. It's easy to navigate. Um, it's intuitive. And the students have uh, appreciated it so far. Okay. So reflecting on your teaching, how long have you been teaching now? It's my 10th year. 10th year. Okay. So do you think you'd ever go back to doing like you used to do before the video casting stuff and screen casting? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Um, I used to get so frustrated with trying to budget time and it just felt like every single day was a race. And now, in some ways it still is, but it offers us a moment to pause and reflect and really um, delve into the material more and in a more meaningful way. And it's not just, you know, I've told the students, it's, it's not what I know, it's, it's what you understand. And the latter part has really picked up since I've been uh, posting the videos. So what do you think it would take to get other educators and your colleagues to be able to look to do this as part of their teaching and learning practice? I've been fortunate enough to have um, an administration and a central office that's been very supportive of this, and I think that that's key, that they financially support this, um, they've given us uh, release time, um, they've given us training on our smart boards, um, and uh, our administrator in charge of all this has, has done a wonderful job of being mobile enough to come into classrooms to teach us how to use our software, how to connect it to the hardware, and then teachers are always sharing ideas, and we have a few different teachers doing the flipped model in, in very different ways, and so it's been beneficial for us to hear, this is how I'm doing it, so I'm doing it, and I think with other teachers hearing, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do this, and, uh, but the first is the financial support, the backing of the administration. If you don't have the software, the hardware, it's, uh, it makes life difficult, and most teachers, I would think, would probably not like that uh, to start off some. If the Kent ISD or anybody could give you more support for the rest of your teachers here on actually how to do the blended learning model and the flipped model, do you think that would help your school district? I think it would, yeah. I think the more teachers see other teachers not only using this, but being successful, um, 
having data to back that up, um, that will really start to, I think, change some minds. Okay. okay. Anything else you'd like other teachers to know about this flipped model? Yeah, I guess one is to have an open mind, uh, to know that you're going to run into some roadblocks, um, but that with other teachers, the administration, you can certainly overcome those. And the, the most important thing I would say is if you're going to try this, use your students as feedback. They're the, they're the best uh, support you have, and they actually will give you some of the best advice. I thought one of my first videos this year was pretty short. It was 20 minutes long. And the students came to me and said, Mr. Vanderwall, it takes you 20. It takes us 40 then because we'll pause, we'll rewind it, which was a great lesson uh, for me. So to keep it to 10 to 15 minutes is much more manageable for them. So use your students if you try it. They have some awesome ideas. Oh, my God.